Hello and welcome back to YouTube Vet. Today we're going to talk about cranial cruciate ligament disease in dogs. This is a very common disease that we see mainly in our athletic breed dogs, but really we can see it across the board in all breeds, and it is tear of the cranial cruciate ligament, which is just another name for the anterior cruciate ligament, or ACL, as you would refer to in a person. So let's start off by having a look at some anatomy and figure out what ligament this is and what this means. Let's take a look. All right, let's take a look at this model, guys. It's going to show us an ACL. So here on the far right, we're going to take a look at this knee. Kneecap, this is the outside of the leg, the inside of the leg. This is the knee joint. I'm going to move this out of the way. This is our patella, attached to the patella tendon. And if we look down in there, what we're going to see this first little ligament right here starting here attaching to the front portion of this tibial plateau right into the back portion of this uh, femur, distal femur, or upper leg bone. This ligament is the one we're referring to. This ligament tends to tear which will then allow the tibia to thrust forward relative to the femur. And I'm going to show you guys a video example of that in a live patient as to what exactly that looks like on our exams. But that is our ligament of interest, okay? Some other important anatomy Again, there's our kneecap, sits in that groove, uh, that's the normal orientation. And then we have our meniscus. We have our uh, medial meniscus and our lateral meniscus, the two cushions, the two cartilage cushions that people refer to holding and, and kind of supporting the cartilage surface on the condyles of that upper leg bone. Okay, ligaments, posterior, and again, cranial cruciates, and then we have um, the lateral and medial um, ligaments basically are collateral ligaments of that knee. All these things work in concert to keep this knee firm and stable. So my guess is if you brought your pup in because he's limping on that back leg, my general discussion I have with clients, again, if they're limping on a back leg, a lot of times you should be looking at the knee. If you're looking at the knee and we don't have any other diseases to be thinking about, something infectious in your area, some other type of injury, the ACL is the first thing we look at. I just showed you kind of what that will look like on exam. In addition to that, we're also seeing other features. We're comparing the two sides, feeling for swelling. Sometimes we see it, sometimes we don't. We're flexing that knee, we're flexing it and extending it, trying to feel for clicks, for crunching, things that would suggest other pathology to the structures around that knee. Also those meniscus, we're trying to feel for any damage to that by kind of assessing the way that, that knee may sound. Again, if we find things, that means they're probably there. If we don't find them, unfortunately it doesn't mean they're not there, but just not manifesting on our exam. So it can be pretty challenging to be 100% confident as to all the abnormalities we have, in addition to the very obvious cranial cruciate ligament tear that may be contributing to this puppy's condition. Okay, so that exam is important in trying to decide exactly what the extent of that injury is. So why do we care? Why do we care if they have an ACL tear? Well, obviously he's limping, so he hurts. That's, that's important. But what's more? Well, I have this handy little model here, or diagram, kind of running through, really just an assessment of arthritis, because the biggest thing is, you tear a vital structure in the knee, you're going to end up with uh, degenerative joint disease as that knee is now allowed to have increased motion amidst those structures. Okay, so really that joint disease is set off by instability or fragmentation of joint structures, which will then cause irritation to the tissues of that knee, loss of cartilage surfaces, or laying down of tissue such as mineral deposits and inflammatory fibrin, on those joint surfaces creating a rough uncomfortable surface and then you end up eventually down the line as you look kind of at these models you end up with a knee that has huge amounts of arthritic change around the edges of uh, both the bony structures and the cartilage structures those just cause pain I don't think you need any explanation on that arthritis as a lot of you guys are probably suffering from from, an, uh, from a, a gross standpoint can be pretty dramatic in other cases, you can have a dog with huge amounts of, of pain without having huge amounts of radiographic or even gross changes. And it could be associated with more of an, an earlier arthritis scenario. 
So really, with an ACL tear, big picture, reason we care, we don't want to end up looking like bone number four. So what do we do when we find an ACL tear? Well, that's going to be a decision your doctor and you are going to have to discuss. There's a number of ways to go about it. Repairing an ACL is kind of an art, and some people don't even do it. You know, you have to see what your doctor's recommendations are. That is going to be your first step, but I promise you there are some doctors in some cases where you may decide just to try to let it heal. Rehabilitate it. Physiotherapy may be the route you go. You may reach for cold laser therapy. You may reach for adequan injections, which are glucosamine types of injections. You may try to manage things with anti-inflammatories. But ultimately, if you're going in a conservative direction with this, some type of physiotherapy to rehabilitate this joint and try to scar it down, because really an unstable joint is going to have to scar down, is going to be your modality of choice. My discussion is based more on the surgical options. So that's, that's kind of where I want to focus this, because a lot of people watching this video have probably been just hit with an estimate for a surgery. It's an overwhelming procedure to take on as an owner, because it's a big amount of money and uh, it's something that you have to be kind of educated on to go forward with. So that's what I want to kind of talk about currently in this video is being produced. What are the surgeries we do and you know, kind of what can we expect when we do those surgeries. Let's take another look. So the first repair I'm going to talk to you guys about is called extracapsular repair or lateral suture or tightrope. You name it, different names for kind of the same approach. What we're trying to do because we're still not in veterinary medicine um, routinely replacing the ligament itself like they'll do in people. You'll hear in people having tendon grafts to literally go in, drill holes and recreate that ACL. We're not really doing that um, in routine practice, even in routine specialty surgical practice, doing that type of repair. What we are trying to do is, um, is, is in some cases, especially in the smaller dogs, we find this outcome to be more favorable in smaller dogs, um, is to recreate that effect that suture, uh, or sorry, that um, supportive effect of that ligament, but instead of doing it internally, we do it on the outside. So we're actually going to run a suture around the fabella, so which is basically going to be around a little sesamoid bone that hides in behind this femur, um, and run that down through the front of the tibial crest, and that, when tightened down, will actually prevent that sliding action of the tibia relative to the femur. There's another approach where we actually drill a hole just through this condyle, this lateral condyle of the femur, and run our suture that way. But ultimately, and then that's nice because you're not using soft tissues as much, you're using more of a bony attachment point. So the argument in that kind of case is you may have less um, loosening of that stitch material or suture material as the tissues underneath it die from being crushed down over a period of time. So it's a more solid lateral soft tissue repair. So again, what we're doing in those cases, a lot of times we are, we may or may not open the joint. So you're going to have to ask you, if you're curious, you'll have to ask your vet what they do. Some look in, some don't. If you look in, the purpose of that is to either remove debris that you see, so remnants of the ACL, and or assess the, uh, the meniscal tissues. Because a lot of times we find out dogs have torn their meniscus at the same time as they tore that ACL. Um, if they haven't torn that meniscus, there's another group of, another camp of discussion as to whether or not we actually do some meniscal repair or meniscal release, as we call it, prophylactically, therapeutically, or if we ignore the meniscus altogether as long as it looks healthy. But there is an incredible amount of debate on whether or not we address the meniscus at the time of surgery when it looks healthy. But that is, again, a discussion to have with your particular vet or surgeon at the time you go in. Um, so once this lateral suture has been placed on, we're going to usually bandage his legs for between 24 hours and two weeks just to kind of keep them off it, keep them swelling under control, and then go through rehabilitation exercises. But this uh, post-operatively is a surgery where these dogs can make a pretty quick recovery because there's no major bony damage or repair performed. Drilling some holes is about as serious as it gets. So that's kind of your lateral capsular surgical approach. And that's the anatomy you're going to be seeing when we do this surgery. Now let's move on and talk about the bigger surgeries that we sometimes do. So we get into the bigger dogs. That lateral suture approach may not be the top choice your vet comes up with. Doesn't mean it's wrong. If that's a suggestion he has for you, 
it's absolutely an appropriate method of fixation. However, in a lot of cases, in a lot of, um, a lot of practices, they're moving away from that kind of approach when the animal is over, say, 40 or 50 pounds, just because their tendency to want to strain those um, ligature or uh, suture materials um, becomes much higher. So when we're looking at these cases, we start looking less at how to avoid the drawer scenario and more towards creating a better geometric alignment in this knee. And knowing why they do that is kind of an important understanding of how this surgery works. So let's take a look at this knee again, figure out what the heck we're doing when we do some of these big surgeries. Let's take a look. So let's talk a bit about why we do that TPLO. What exactly is the anatomic predisposition of these knees to create that forward thrusting of that tibia and predispose them to tearing that ACL or, or just frustrating that ACL. Well, what that essentially is, is, is at the end of the day, you have an overly steep angle and it's related to a measurement that we take of this bone relative to this bone. But what do you need to know? Ultimately, these are dogs that have a plateau that almost slopes a bit backwards. And if you imagine their knees always like this, and there's always a downward pressure, you push down on something that's sloped that way, and that pushes the, the, this lower leg bone forward, okay? So if that's happening, we're constantly holding, it's like a, a boat moored to a, uh, to a dock on a rope, and that waves are pulling on that dock, pulling that rope, eventually that rope snaps. And what can happen is you can walk and have to take a pee and that rope snaps, okay? So what we're doing at TPLO is saying, we know that rope is snapped. Maybe we'll go in there and remove the fragments of rope that are now floating around causing some anxiety to that joint. But at the end of it, we're not gonna worry so much about replacing the rope. We're gonna change, we're gonna create calmer waters. Let's use that analogy. So what we're gonna do is create a cut. And it's gonna be on the inside surface where things are nice and, nice and bony and flat. We're gonna create a cut a wedge shaped cut and we're actually going to rotate this bone so that plateau becomes less steep and more flat or even slightly rotated so it, it, it essentially traps this upper leg bone relative to the lower leg bone. Now we don't want to over rotate it, we want to go for about a six or five degree, it's kind of our magic number down from you know sometimes much beyond that um, uh, angle and what that's going to do is eliminate that thrusting force. Now it does put a little bit more strain on that posterior cruciate ligament, okay, or caudal, or uh, posterior cruciate ligament. Um, but if we over rotate, we can put too much pressure back there. So we do want to hit that magic number. And of course, we have in surgery specific uh, guidelines that we follow to ensure that we do that and that we succeed with that. Let's take a look at an x-ray, see what this looks like in surgery. Okay, let's take a look. Here we are. Upper leg bone, lower leg bone. This is our actual kneecap, patella tendon, quadriceps muscle group. Um, and here's, here's, of course, the knee joint. Here's that fabella. We hook around that in some of our lateral suture repairs. And when we make our little hole, again, that's down there. But again, talking TPLO. So here you're going to see this is the tibial angle. Probably used to align something like that. So again, sloping backwards, which would encourage the thrust. Well, here we cut this. Now, this is after it's healed cut it and rotated it to kind of eliminate that angle. We put this plate on. In actuality, that plate looks exactly like this, okay? This is actually upside down because this whole, video, this whole uh, image has been manipulated, but the plate looks about like that on the bone, okay? In this case, we're using the metallic plate. Um, but you can really see post-operatively, you're gonna get some great healing. And in this dog, we have still a little bit of a fusion that we can see, a little bit of swelling in here. But this is an example of a patient that's done really, really well and it's healed properly. And at the end of the day, it's had a great outcome. Interestingly, on this patient, this is his plate. Okay, this is the actual plate. And normally, we don't take these implants out after surgery unless there was a problem. And in this guy who did encounter an issue, his body was essentially forming excessive uh, reactivity to this plate. Something you'll see less commonly with titanium than the stainless steel, but um, you know, most cases this plate stays in for the remainder of that dog's life. So we talked TPLOs, we talked extra capsular repairs. What other repairs are there? Well, there are other repairs. There's actually a myriad of other repairs 
uh, described to, to correct a cranial cruciate or, or ACL tear in a dog. Um, the other major one you're going to see, and I'm not going to talk about it uh, specifically today, but it works on the geometry much like the TPLO did. It's called tibial tuberosity advancement, wherein what they've done is create your cut along this tuberosity itself, tip that forward, and that basically has the patella tendon create some stabilizing properties for that knee as well. Um, again, others do exist, um, not as commonly used, my guess is, if it's 2000 five or later when you're watching this video, which it's going to be, you're not going to hear a lot of people recommending something too far from what you've heard today. If you do, it doesn't mean it's wrong. Your veterinarian is the one you need to, to speak with to kind of get the information, to get the lowdown on your specific case and your pet. Um, but really what you need to know is, is this is a surgery that um, can create a really good outcome. But you also have to understand once these joints have gone through a trauma, like an ACL tear, meniscal tear, you name it. These joints do tend to be problematic joints for the rest of that dog's life. So long-term management is often the name of the game, whether it's pain medication, kind of on an episodic basis for you know, occasional recurrences or resurgences of lameness, long-term glucosamines, omega-3s, very important in my protocol with my patients to kind of protect what we have left of that joint and uh, realizing some degree of osteoarthritis is often unavoidable. These are things to kind of implement and keep these pets comfortable um, for, the, for as long as we can. So I'm going to leave comments open. You know, we always do that here. If you have any specific questions about these surgeries, if you've heard about a surgery that, again, I haven't talked about, kind of falling into the current fringe as far as surgical repairs uh, or any other ta uh, techniques you're interested in uh, hearing about, arthroscopy, just post up below. I'll try to reference something for you if I can't answer the question myself. But again, thanks for watching, guys. Hopefully we can get your dog straightened away.